are longing. Everybody, welcome to Chapel! Please stand and worship with us.
everybody. Today's chapel speaker is none other than the legendary Wheaton College head football coach, Mike Swider. <laughs> yes, yes. He was involved with Wheaton College football for 39 years as a player and as a coach, and in 24 seasons as head coach, he earned 209 career wins, a mark that ranks 35th among the NCAA head football coaches of all time at any level. More than an amazing coach, he's also an amazing man of God and has impacted literally thousands of young men for the kingdom of God. We are so blessed that he, uh, within his retirement, that he has chosen to serve the coaching staff here at WA. One thing that I appreciate about him is that he never settles for just okay. He always goes the extra mile to push the boundaries of what's possible, whether that's with his faith or his job as a football coach. Before he comes on, let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity that we can gather here today to celebrate your glory, and please give nerves to both Mike Swider and the worship team and to calm them. I pray that you give the blessing upon the student body today and the blessing on myself and Mr. Swider. Amen. Please join me in a round of applause for Mr. Swider. Can I grab that? I grab that. Is this mic on? You guys good? It's good to see all you guys in the front row. Not walking in late, that would have been a bad look, wouldn't it? <laughs> Football coach speaking and you guys straggling in late, that is a bad look. So I challenged these guys, I said, on all those seniors right there in the front row. And so I appreciate you guys heeding my advice there. And, and Brian Hogan, I always want to thank you for this opportunity to be here this morning. That's, that's Brian Hogan, a.k.a. Garth Brooks. Um, I remember when he was uh, the worship pastor of Wheaton Bible. And, uh, and he was singing up there, and I said, man, he could do a lot of things and, and do them well. And one of the things was just a tremendous musician. So you guys are blessed to have him here. And, and I want to thank Brian for this opportunity. Uh, you know, I see these guys out here, and I'm sure there's more back there. I can't, can't see very well here. But, uh, you know, I coach these guys hard, and, and they know it, and the team knows it. And, but I also love them, man. And uh, I've said this many, many times. I'm going to refer to this in the talk a few times. The greatest evidence of love the single greatest evidence of love is that person who's willing to risk his relationship with you to challenge you, to confront you, to tell you you can do better and not to accept where you are. And I, I ride these guys hard, man, and uh, push them hard. And I know there's many, many times when they probably get frustrated with me and, uh, and the demands that are put on them, but uh, they respond and they respond well. And so I love them and they know that. And uh, I just appreciate them so much and this opportunity to be here. I, I, I retired after <clears throat> 40, 42 years coaching. Now I've been two years here, so it's 44 total. My first reason for coming, it was a selfish one. I wanted to, I wanted to hang out with my son for four hours a day. And, uh, and it was a selfish reason, but yet a good one. I could spend time with my, my son and not steal his personal time and spend four hours a day with him. And, and uh, it's morphed in even more than that now, just to be able to to be with these guys and coach here, and, and it's, it's been a real blessing to me in my life. I remember the first time I spoke at uh, chapel here, it was 30 years, I believe it was 30 years ago, and it was in the uh, little white chapel over there by the baseball field. Uh, it was somewhere around 1990, somewhere in that time frame, and, and uh, I was just a young pup then. Uh, I'm 66 now, so the time goes fast. And, uh, but I remember being in that, and then I remember speaking over here in another building, and then here a few years back. So. It really is a joy to be here, and, and, uh, and then I, I need to give a shout out real quick. Is I see I saw Coach Musso here, and and uh, then there's Brad Thornton. These are all guys I coach. Coach Johannick, uh, Coach Kermit, Coach Kermit around here with his million. There you guys with million dollar smile right there. So there's a bunch of my former players now that are coaching here. Like I said, Musso and Thornton, of course Justin, my son, and Coach Johannick, Kermit, and. And there's the shout out to all those guys. It's, it's so great to see them now. I saw them when they were 18, 19, 20 year old kids and to see them now in positions of influence, we're gonna talk about that here shortly as well, is really heartwarming. And so it, it is great to be here. I, you know, I, I thought it'd be good for me just to start out before I, I, I quickly have four things I wanna share with you. Um, 
uh, that, that, that are prerequisites if you're going to ever grow spiritually, if you're going to develop spiritual disciplines, which I know are, is a theme here. There, there's four things I think are absolutely critical as a foundation. Uh, but before I get there, you know, I'm sitting there listening to this praise and worship music, and I walk in, and I go, man, you guys are blessed. And then I, know, I obviously know some of these teachers and the faculty here. And uh, you got to take advantage of what you have. You really do. And I'm going I'm to share with you, before you get started, three things I think that are absolutely critical if you're going to take advantage of this opportunity of being at Wheaton Academy, because it really is a blessing. Uh, the first is something our players have heard all the time. You've got to be someone who wants to be motivated. Okay, I have no shot to motivate you today unless you want to be. That's not on me, it's on you. There's not a teacher in this school that can motivate you unless you want them to. There's not a coach in this school that can motivate you unless you want them to motivate you. There's not a pastor in this world that can motivate you on a Sunday morning unless you want them to. You can open up that Bible unless you want to be motivated. You can have a hard time. You can go into a small group somewhere and the leader, unless you want to be motivated, you're not going to get motivated. That's on you. You got to want to be motivated. You got to want to be challenged. You got to want to be confronted. You got to want someone to look you in the eye and say, that's not good enough. And if you take that personally, you're never going to go from here to here in any area of life, not in biology, chemistry, spiritually, athletically, musically, whatever it is. The only way progress is made is by you entering the arena and saying, I want to get better. I want to be pushed. I want to be challenged. You get a paper back and it's all marked up with red and the teacher says, you know, you can write better than this if you take it personally. And you get abrasive and you front up, you're, not, you're never going to write better. You know, if I'm challenging these players that they got to run harder, do something better, and they look at me and they go, oh, that's good. No, you're never going to get better. You know, if you go into a Sunday service in church and the pastor challenges you and you think you're good enough where you are, you're, you're never going to get better. And so the, the, the first thing I want to challenge you with here today is, is, uh, is, is be someone who wants to be motivated today and every day. Every day you walk into this place, the opportunity is, is mind-boggling. I mean, just, just up here listening to this, you got this how many days a week? Two days a week you get this? And I see the garbage that other kids are getting in other places? And you get this two days a week? You should get on your knees and praise God every night that this is what you get two days a week to be able to assemble like this. These are gifts. And every time you go into any class here, I know, I mean, I know some of the teachers, I just called them out. But the others are just the same. Be going to that class looking to be challenged, looking to go from where you are to the next step. Because if you don't, you're never going to, where you are is where you'll stay. So be someone to, who wants to be motivated. And I always, I always said this, I told my son growing up, my job's not to be your friend, my job was to be your father. I tell these guys all the time, my job's not to be your friend or your buddy, it's to be your football coach. Your teacher's job's not to be your friend, it's to be your biology teacher. Now, if we happen to be your friend when it's all said and done, that's great. But that's not our goal. Our goal is to challenge you and get you to the next level, so respond to that. I think the second thing I think is critical and something I've really learned now that I've retired is that unless you're a person of influence, you really leave nothing. You know, now that I'm retired, I, I think about it, I say, if I leave someone money, all they're going to do is spend it. If I leave them a reputation, you heard about the wins and everything, yada, 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 all the victories. All you're going to do, you, you forget it. But what you leave inside someone transcends your life. What you leave inside somebody will transcend your life. And so as all these guys have called me over the years, over a thousand guys I've coached, none of them talk about the wins and losses. You know what? They all talk about the influence I had. Because the other, you forget. The only thing that, when I'm dead and gone, the only thing that's going to remain is what I leave in somebody. And the same goes for you. I want to challenge you to be a person of influence on this campus. Be, because I'll tell you what, 20 years from now, if you were a star athlete or the, 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 the smartest kid in the school, whatever it is, the greatest musician, they're going to forget that. You know what they're going to remember? Did you influence anybody? What kind of legacy did you leave? You know, that's, do, do people matter to you? Do you treat people as things that they matter to you? Do you spend time developing relationships with those people around you? Does your, <clears throat> excuse me, does your life inspire people? Does your life inspire people to go from here to here, or does your life discourage people, tear them down? This is all influence, people, and I want to challenge you to be people of influence. You know, I've said this many times, that true personal gratification never comes through self for, or true personal fulfillment number comes through self-gratification, doing things for yourself. 
True personal fulfillment always comes from acts of service. It always comes from investing in somebody else. That's where fulfillment comes from. It never comes from it. It doesn't mean we shouldn't work hard. These guys know that. It doesn't mean when a scoreboard got on the goal, it's not to win, because they're gone and it is. Friday night, we're going to play to win. Okay? But fulfillment comes from investment in people. Are you investing in those classmates of yours in, the, in this community? If you're going to maximize this community, invest into it. How will you be remembered when you leave? By what you did or what you invested in people? By what you did or did you inspire this campus? And I think if you do that, you'll receive as well. And then the third thing, before we get started on these other things, and I'm going to have to go fast here. I could talk forever here, but I know I'm limited. And I think it's 1107, you've got to be out the door. Otherwise, Kermit will get mad at me. Um, <clears throat> And he won't flash me that smile. Uh, but the, the third thing here before we get on to the, the, the main part of this is if you're going to maximize your experience here, you've got to never forget there are only two days guaranteed in your life. There are only two days guaranteed in your life. This day and that day. Today. It's guaranteed we're sitting here, so we got today, don't we? I don't know how long, but we got We got today. Tomorrow's not guaranteed, is it? The only other guarantee is that day when Jesus comes back. That's the only other guaranteed day we got. If you want to live this day well, live it in light of that day. And you will live well. But here's the problem. Most people think that day will never come. We got a world that thinks that day is never going to come. And they don't live well today because of that. I'm just telling you that that day is coming for all of us. We can't deny it. Someday the Lord's going to take us home. Someday we'll cease to breathe here on earth. Live today in light of that day. So that when that day comes, your maker who blew breath into your body says, well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things, and I'll make you master over many. And so, live today, today on this campus, in light of that day when Jesus returns, and you will live better. You will inspire this campus. You will make a difference in the lives of people around you. And be someone today, when you walk into class, wants a teacher to motivate you, wants to be challenged, wants to be confronted, wants to get better. I think if you remember those three things, I think you got a shot. I think you got a shot to maximize this place, which is a blessing, and don't take it for granted. Um, okay, I, 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 when, when um, Brian asked me to speak, and i got a few minutes here left, he wanted me to challenge you guys or to talk in, in light of these spiritual disciplines, and, and I was thinking about spiritual disciplines and whether it's prayer or whatever it is, remembrance and, and some of these things. What, what, what's got to be the bedrock? I mean, we can say we're going to have all these disciplines in our life, but what, what, what's gotta, who do we got to be in order for these disciplines to manifest themselves? And, uh, and who do we got to be for sustained spiritual growth? What, what's got to be the foundation if we're going to continually be growing spiritually? If we're going to be developing these spiritual disciplines like quiet times and prayer life and Bible reading, those disciplines, what, what, what's got to be the foundation? And the first thing that I jotted down here is we got to be men and women of commitment. We got to be committed. We got to be committed to that discipline. We got to be committed to growth. We got to be committed to football. We got to be committed to that class. And you know what? In, in our culture, that's, that's a word that's just totally misrepresented. Jesus asked you to what? Commit your life to Christ. That's what we said we did, didn't we? Isn't that the word we used? I committed my life to Christ. You know what that means? Quitting is not an option. That's what it means. Quitting isn't a solution to your frustration with anything that you committed to. But the problem is, so many times we choose to commit, to quit. See, quitting gives you a moment of relief and a lifetime of regret. You know why we quit? We want a moment of relief. Because we naturally, the human, sinful, frail heart, seeks ease and comfort. That's what we default to. 
and it gives you a lifetime of regret when you quit. You say, I'm going to read the Bible. I'm going to be in church on Sunday. I'm going to be involved in my small group. I'm going to study. I'm going to run. I'm going to lift. I'm going to do whatever it is. I'm going to commit myself to this thing, to developing this spiritual discipline, whatever it is. Well, if quitting is an option, you will use it. I promise you. It will get bad enough that someday you will use it. Can't be an option. Quitting cannot be a solution to your frustration with anything that you've committed to. I'll never forget, we just had our first Navy SEAL at Wheaton football. We said Army Rangers and Delta Force guys, but I had a guy that graduated two years ago. In fact, I coached his dad 30 years ago. His dad's an orthodontist, he's a Navy SEAL. Okay, he just got the, the Trident pin. SEAL Team 7. 280 started in his SEAL class. 37 finished. Now those 280 weren't chopped liver. Those 37 definitely weren't. I asked him, what was the difference? He said, I said between those 37 and 248 that started, whatever it was. He says, the guys that made it never, forget why, never forgot why they signed up. We wanted to be Navy SEALs. And I never forgot that. You want to be a football player? It's going to be hard. Don't forget why you signed up. You're in an English class. Don't forget why you walked into class. Whatever you do, whatever cause you devote yourself to, whatever responsibility you assume, don't forget why you signed up. You gave your life to Jesus. Why did you make a commitment to Jesus? Continually remind yourself of why you did it. And if you never forget why you did it, you'll see it through. Because you did it for pure, great reasons. In a calm state. In a relaxed, I'm doing this because I want this for my life. And then you know what? All heck breaks loose. And then all of a sudden, you know what we do? Seek ease and comfort. And we want that moment of relief. Instead of giving you a moment of relief, we get a lifetime of regret. Don't quit. Two, discipline. Can you labor with no immediate return for your labor? That's what discipline is. Can you work and get nothing in return? Okay? I, I'm a, a winter workout for a football guy. He, he comes back from that winter workout lifting weights in January. There's no immediate return. The return comes in September. But can you labor and nothing return? Same thing, picking up your Bible and reading every day. Praying every day. Sometimes, you know, the only reason I do that, it's because of discipline. Because sometimes I don't feel like doing it. And sometimes I don't even feel like I got anything out of it. But I do it for discipline. Because someday, it's going to come back. And I'm going to need it. My players hear me say this all the time. You don't rise to the occasion. What do you do? You default to your level of preparation. Those guys were listening to me, weren't they? You do not rise to the occasion. You default to your level of preparation. Football-wise, spiritually, academically. When that test comes, you don't rise to the occasion and do well on that test. You default to your preparation. Did you listen in class? Did you show up in class? Did you study? You never rise to the occasion in anything you do in life. You default to your preparation. Your preparation requires discipline. Discipline are those people who can labor. And while they're laboring, they know there's no immediate return for this. But you know what? we got a culture, especially as younger generation. They want something. I work, I want. I'm going to work hard, but I, what do I get? I'm going to do it, but what do I get? Nothing. Down the road you get something. Can you do it with no return? You're a disciplined person. Someday you're going to have to put money aside for retirement. You got your first job. You're 24 years old, whatever it is. The retirement guy comes by and says, I want $100 a month. What do I get? You get nothing. I mean, I'm going to give you $100 a month and I get nothing? That's right. In 40 years, you'll have a million. But you know what people don't do? They don't because they want it now. They're undisciplined. They need something right now in return for their effort or for their sacrifice. Doesn't work that way. Spiritual disciplines, you're going to become, we're talking about prayer with Thunder Thornton. I call him Thunder Thornton. Thunder Thornton, man, he talks about prayer life, right? Well, that prayer life, I'm going to tell you right now, it's going to require discipline. It's going to require you to do sometimes. You don't feel like doing it. But you do it knowing that the return is going to be a life of spiritual growth. 
as you draw closer to Jesus. Got seven minutes here. Can I get it done? All right. So remember that. You never rise to the occasion. You default. And the other thing I'll tell you right there too, choose your pain before we go on the next thing. Players hear me say this all the time. Choose your pain. Every day there's going to be pain. Choose it. You either choose the pain of discipline or the pain of regret. The pain of discipline, choose it. I'm going to study tonight. I'm going to study as hard as I can. And I don't want to do it because there's something fun going on. But I'm going to choose that pain. Or the pain of regret when the test comes and you're not ready. Choose your pain. You're going to have pain. Every single day you're going to experience pain. Just choose it. I choose the pain of discipline. The pain of discipline goes away. Soon, you know what, the study session's in. The wait program's over. That disciplined activity, there's an end to it. But the pain of regret will haunt you to the day you die. Don't choose it. Don't default to it. Choose the pain of discipline in all that you do. Number three, conviction and courage. You've got to be men and women of conviction and men and women of courage. Without courage, all virtue is meaningless. All conviction is meaningless. All these great ideals, these spiritual disciplines, they're all meaningless without courage to be able to act on them when the world says no. Courage to be able to live out your convictions in a world that's hostile. Where do you get your convictions? Where are you getting yours? TikTok? I don't even know what TikTok is. <laughs> I can't even spell it. You get it off the internet? I don't know. Where do you get your convictions? You, you, you turn on a TV, you get some conviction? Where do you get your principles? Where is truth to you? Where do you find truth? Where do you get your identity? There's only one place. Otherwise, your life's going to be like this. There's only one place, and that's in the rock found in Jesus Christ, who died on a cross for you. And he blew breath into your body, and he made you, and he created you with a purpose. You are not random. You were created with a purpose. And the God who made you, open up his word, and he will teach you truth. Truth's not what you think. Me, that guy, that guy, the guy on the TV. That's not truth. Who do they think they are to think they know what truth is? Truth is what God said is truth. And open up his word and find it and discover it. And then you know what? Have the courage to live by it. And courage isn't the absence of fear. Courage is people who experience fear and act anyhow. So don't think, well, I'm a, I'm a little bit afraid, I'm a little nervous. Well, who isn't? Act anyhow. Besides, courageous people fear God. The fear of the Lord is what? The beginning of wisdom. Who do you fear? God? If you fear God, and you have an awesome respect for God, you know what? You'll live the same way all the time. But if you fear your audience, and you fear whatever group and subgroup you're around, you will adopt their morals, their values, their convictions, their truths. You can't fear them. Because then you live a life and you're a chameleon who just adapts to the environment. You want to be a difference maker? You want to develop spiritual disciplines? Then fear God. I'm going to be really honest with you, really blunt. You know what you people think of me is irrelevant. I don't really care what you think of me. I really don't. I hope you like me. I hope my players like me. I worry about what God thinks. It's the only one that counts. Because this might be my last day, right? This, this might, be, might be my last day. You think I'm worried about what you guys think of me? I could be dead tomorrow. I could be meeting my maker tomorrow. So why should I worry about that? Live courageously. Who do you fear? And live courageously. Number four, I got to go. I, I could talk for 30 minutes on each of these things. Number four, don't forget the cost of your salvation. Don't ever forget it. For God, what? So loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but what? Have everlasting life. He so loved the world. Here's the bottom line. You see my son, I used this example on the football field last Easter. All you guys right here, I was pointing to the football team. You're all on death row. You're condemned to die. So am I. We're all condemned to die. But I got a plan. You're all condemned to die. Got a death sentence waiting you. But I got a plan. And Justin is standing next to me. My son. My first son. I put my arm around. I said, he and I got a plan. He dies, you live. Justin, my son, who I love more than anything else, he dies, you all live. 
And he's in on it with me. That's what God did with his son. He's in on it with me. And I watch my son get beaten beyond human recognition and get stu sores stuck in his side and suffocate on a cross. I watch that happen to him. So you can live. Would you ever be ashamed of me? Would you? Would you ever doubt my love? Would you ever doubt whether I loved you? Cared about you? Had a plan for you? Would you ever not talk to me? How about, would you ever not talk to me during the day? Pray to me? It's praying is talking. Would you ever not listen to me, read my word? My son died, was beaten the most brutal death in the history of mankind for you, and you are living. You know what happened? You would never forget me. You would never be ashamed of me. You would never worry about what the world thought. You would live boldly. You would never be ashamed to be associated with the cross. Never would you be ashamed. But you know what happened? We forget. We forget why we get heaven. I tell our players all the time, we deserve hell and we get heaven. If we're not smiling, who's smiling? Who out in the world is smiling? We deserve hell. And we got heaven. Because God's Son died for us. Don't forget it. If my son had died and all you lived, I hope you wouldn't forget me. I hope you wouldn't be ashamed of me. Don't ever forget the cost of your salvation. Be men and women that are committed, disciplined, have convictions based on Scripture and the courage to live them out, and never forget the cost of your salvation. And you will grow spiritually, and you will establish spiritual disciplines. Be someone who wants to be motivated here. Be a person of influence on this campus. And don't forget, you only got two days guaranteed. This day and that day. Live wisely. Okay, we're going to pray here right now. And I'm going to ask you before I pray to take a minute and just try to ponder on one thing that I said. Just try to zero in on one thing I said and remember it as you exit this building. Our dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for today and for your love and for your goodness, for who you are, for dying on the cross for our sins. I want to thank you for Wheaton Academy and what it stands for and what it represents in a world that is so hostile. I pray for this institution, Lord, that you may never let it waver, that it may stand on a firm foundation based on Scripture. I pray for all these men and women in this room, Lord, these young men and women, that you may make them men and women of courage, of conviction, of passion. Lord, who want to be motivated, who want to be challenged, who live today in the light of tomorrow or that day that's coming soon. Lord, I pray that you bless them with a great day. Lord, I pray that you help them maximize their potential. And I pray that all of them might come to an honest and a great relationship with you, their Lord and Savior. I pray this all in your name because you died for us 2,000 years ago. Amen.